Hello and welcome to Against the Law, the myth-busting ancient history podcast. I'd like to extend a welcome to you, all you cool cats and kittens, as you join us for today's episode. We're going to be chatting about pets in the ancient world. If we stumble across a misconception, you'll hear this noise. That's the sound of the Against the Law gavel dispelling myths. I'm joined by a fantastic menagerie of guests today. Call it puppy love, but Xenia's mad about all things ancient Rome. Meg will tell us all about ancient Greece, straight from the Trojan horse's mouth. Barney's no one-trick pony with his knowledge of various places in the ancient Near East. And with the lion's share of info about ancient Egypt, we are delighted to be joined today by Professor Salima Ikram, Professor of Egyptology at the American University in Cairo. Hello. Like a fish out of water, I'm Flo, and I don't know much about the ancient world, but I'm excited to learn with you all about ancient pets. So I'm definitely more of a cat person than a dog person. Um, and when I think of ancient Egypt, I think of cats. Is that is that something that is that is a real fact that is true or is it something that's a misconception? Actually, um, although cats were revered in ancient Egypt, I don't think they were as revered as people like to think of them today. Um, because in fact, the first thing to be domesticated, first animal domesticated in Egypt was a dog. And so dogs had a, a march on cats in terms of being beloved by the ancient Egyptians. Though um, once the cat arrived in Egypt, it certainly did uh, make itself known. And uh, in fact, most of the domestic cats that we have all over the world have some Egyptian cat blood in them. Ooh, so a house pet cat could, could have its roots in ancient Egypt. Yeah, in fact, because they, they were exported and that's probably why they have made their way all across the world. Um, because the cats here are, of course, far more elegant than other cats um, <laughs> and far more intelligent than other cats. Um, and so, of course, because there was so much trade going on and so many ports um, along the Mediterranean coast, as well as, of course, some um, other ways, land routes by which people were toing and froing, the cats moved around quite a lot. I wonder if they were kept on boats as pest control, because cats are quite handy as pest control. Um, I know even now, nowadays, people will have a ship cat. So I wonder if that was a, a dual purpose thing, exporting cats, but also having them to get rid of pests. I think that's actually how it really happened is because they were keeping the rats at bay and so they were hanging around docks in any case and then they would just climb on board and people were quite welcoming. If cats weren't maybe as revered as I thought, um, were they were they kept as as pets at all or were they sort of, because in my head when I was at school I was told that they were sort of worshipped as a sort of pseudo deity and that was at my primary school that was the messaging that I got but were they were they kept as pets at all? Well insofar as a cat is kept as a pet generally in my experience the human is the pet of the cat. <laughs> <laughs> That's true that is true. And in ancient Egypt, they, there were cats kept human beings, and then there were special cats that were revered because they were associated with the cat goddess Bastet. But in that way, in fact, many, many animals were associated with specific gods. And so one example of that particular animal would be worshipped um, because it would be thought that the spirit of the god had entered into it. And so you would have one sacred cat and one sacred dog and one sacred baboon, um, et cetera. And um, then you'd have a whole bunch of others that were not sacred and were not worshipped. So were pets or, or beloved animals ever mummified? Absolutely. Pets were mummified and um, sacred animals were mummified. And then, in fact, um, a rather cruel practice was the giving of votive animal mummies. And for that, a lot of animals lost their lives because they were blood sacrifices and they were then mummified and given as offerings to the gods. But certainly there were pet cats and pet dogs who were mummified and sometimes they even had their own coffins and they were buried beside the owner in, in the tomb. So it's really quite sweet. It's quite sweet. So you can take your pets with you to the afterlife. Absolutely. That also happens in Greece, but with dogs. 
So cats are actually not that popular in ancient Greece. Um, they were about, and you see there's some of them in sort of pictures and paintings and stuff, but they weren't particularly common as pets in ancient Greece, whereas dogs were all the rage. Everyone loved dogs. Um, and people would be buried with their dogs and dogs would have sort of special burials. And the people in Greece really did also have that sort of idea of like dogs being companions even into the afterlife, which I think is really sweet. That's lovely. In terms of pet dogs, I think one of the ones in ancient Greece which most resembles what we would think of as like a modern pet is lovely Argos, who is Odysseus's dog um, in the Odyssey. And it's such a sad story. So Argos is, is a bit old and gross. Um, Odysseus has been away for like 20 years fighting in Troy and then on his, all of his travels, his Odyssey, getting back home. And he gets there and he sees he sees Argos and he sheds a tear and he asks the um the shepherd he's like oh how's how's Argos and he's like oh he's not doing too great um but Odysseus is in disguise at this point he's disguised himself as a beggar to come home um so that no one recognizes him but Argos does recognize him and then Odysseus goes you know goes into the house and sort of leaves Argos behind outside and then Argos dies because he's he's sort of fulfilled his his destiny of waiting to see his master again after 20 years um I know (laughs) It's like that Futurama storyline where the dog waits for Fry to come back and then and then he never does, except it, on this occasion he does and it, it goes, right, that's what I've been waiting for. I'm now going to quickly cark it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's probably based on it. I think it's so interesting that in, in the ancient world, we, we really get the sense of dogs as an icon of kind of being loyal, lifelong, faithful companions. That's lovely. Was this um so were cats so you you said that cats weren't very popular in ancient Greece how about how about in ancient Rome Xenia? Also not very popular. Um, they became more popular in the later Roman Empire when, as, as Salima said, the sort of Egyptian fashion for cats came uh, and was exported um, to, to the rest of Roman culture and to Italy and, and Rome itself. But uh, Romans also really really liked dogs like the Greeks. Um, And in fact, in Pompeii, we find not only mosaics of dogs, but also dog bones from dogs that had died. And um, there's a fairly famous plaster cast of a dog that that obviously died in the volcanic eruption of Pompeii that sort of preserved everything. One of the mosaics actually says uh, Cave Canem, which means beware of the dog. And it's at the front entrance of the house. Some things really never change. So were, were dogs predominantly used as, as guard animals or working working animals rather than pets? Yeah, mostly guard dogs. Um, there, was, there was quite a big uh, trade in sort of really good, like big dogs. Molossian hounds were quite famous. Um, they were a little bit like Irish wolf hounds. But you could also get um, lap dogs and little dogs um, that were much more for, for pets rather than dogs that had a job. Um, Yeah, so Britain was actually a big exporter of dogs to to the Romans. The Egyptians had a lot of uh, pet dogs and they often had lovely names, you know, the one who is sleek and graceful or great hunter of the oryx. And you see these pictures of kings and uh, noblemen with their dogs surrounding them and each dog has his or her name above it. So it's, it's nice. And, and also we've got a few of the, in the Roman period, I think some of the smaller dogs were brought into Egypt. So even have a Maltese, um, which is quite sweet. Those are beautiful names for dogs, but I wonder what they would have called them if they had pugs, not sleek and graceful, <laughs> small and snorting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Barney, in the ancient Near East, are there, any, are there any stories about dogs in particular that you can think of? Any, any typical... Um, dog ownership stories they're quite well represented in art um i think there's there's lot there's um engravings um and reliefs of uh of, yeah dogs being kept on collars which is a pretty early source for collars existing um again sort of what Xenia mentioned like large that Molossian type like big mastiffs um so they were kept yeah sheep dogs basically guard dogs one of the goddesses, Gula, healing goddess, was associated with a dog. Um, and so you see uh, images of her with the dog sort of at, at her feet, uh, which is quite nice. Uh, so they had a bit of a, a bit of a lucky positive reputation as well. Um, so if Caroline Lawrence were here, she'd be readying her apotropaic alarm because um, dog models were a fairly popular um, little apotropaic object like a, to ward off bad luck. And you would inscribe little kind of pep talk things on them. 
Um, they dug up, I think, a handful, five maybe, under a doorway in, in Nineveh. And um, one of them said, don't think, bite. <laughs> That's me when I see pizza. <laughs> <laughs> No thoughts, just biting. <laughs> so I've been I've been thinking a lot about cats and dogs because those are the two predominant pets that you'd see in an average home in the UK. But um, are there any other animals that I might not expect as pets? I, I think they probably also did this in Greece and Rome. I don't know about the Near East, but certainly in Egypt, we have monkeys that are occasionally kept as pets. Really? They were brought in, in fact, they were imported. So this is the start of the exotic trade pet. Um, and we have uh, monkeys being brought in and they're kept and, and they're also shown under people's chairs and they're shown in people's laps. And there was the really adorable monkey coffin. It's in the shape of a monkey um, with a green monkey being buried in it. And it was all mummified and really, really sweet. Um, they actually had large male baboons that they used as guards and they actually were police baboons so they'd help the policemen and they'd be let <laughs> off their leash um and then it was quite terrifying for anyone because if you've ever seen a baboon's canines they're really scary they are frightening they are really frightening creatures i i would be um i would be a law-abiding citizen if someone walked up to me with a huge baboon <laughs> definitely are you not currently a law-abiding citizen, Flo? <laughs> no, um, unfortunately, I do have a life filled with uh, criminal activity, but, but <laughs> as soon as they introduce baboons, I'll stop, I promise. Okay. Did anyone in the ancient world have um, birds as pets? Because we do, we do now, don't we? We often have caged birds or parakeets or parrots. Yeah, caged birds were very popular in um, ancient Rome. They were much more, uh, they were seen as like a, a woman's pet. Uh, there's a poem that the poet Catullus, uh, he's a love poet, he writes to, he actually writes the poem to his girlfriend's pet sparrow. And Romantic. Yeah, he's sort of saying that, uh, he, he talks about how, how his girlfriend plays with her sparrow, how she pets it, uh, how she cuddles it. Uh, and I, th there are definitely overtones of sort of jealousy at how affectionate she's being with her sparrow but also he says that he wishes he could play with the sparrow too so that um he could stop feeling so stressed and also the so aphrodite uh the goddess of love and, and sexuality who's venus in rome her sacred animal one of them is a sparrow um so i feel like sparrow might might generally be a, a metaphor for some kind of something or other <laughs> something that i wouldn't want to mm. say out loud maybe <laughs> Not I've, if we want to keep this episode clean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a good bird from the ancient Near East. Cool. Go on then, Barney. Yeah. King Hezekiah of Judah. <laughs> He's he was, a bird. Um, <laughs> so when Sennacherib, um, the Neo Assyrian king, sacked uh, that neck of the words Judah, um, he besieged uh, the city of Jerusalem. And um, and he he locked up Hezekiah like a bird in a cage. He said in his annals. Oh, so he's a euphemistic bird in a cage. He's mm, a meta exactly. It's a metaphorical bird in a cage. But what it does show you is that if he's using that as a you know as a simile as an analogy, then they must have kept birds in cages, right? Mm. Very true. What about what about more um sort of livestock type birds like roosters and geese, Salima? Well, we didn't have roosters or chickens here until quite late until about the Ptolemaic period but wasn't it Meg in uh, ancient Greece roosters were given as a, a, a love gift oh I don't know I haven't heard of that it could well be I was thinking of um I'm just going to pass the buck straight on again what about that weren't there geese that saved Rome well I think that you on some of the Greek vases people are the same way the sparrow acted in Catullus the roosters were being passed to and fro as a as a love gift um, but as, as we're keeping the episode clean, we'll just move on, I guess. Yes, no, I do know what you mean, actually. There's that, there's a red figure vase of a, I don't know if this is related, but of a guy riding a massive rooster. I don't know if that's related to that. I can, that's the only one I can think of off the top of my head. Oh, well, um, that was be one of them, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be delighted. I, I'd be delighted if I was offered a, a huge rooster. I don't know if everyone else feels the same way. Sorry, I'll stop. <laughs> Salima, was there not a sort of a primordial goose in ancient Egypt? 
Uh, yes, yes, there are many geese in ancient Egypt and ducks as well. And the duck is a um, symbol of one of the creator gods and the goose is the god uh, Jeb or Geb, the great cackler, and it lays an egg and then the world comes out of it kind of thing. So, I mean, the, in mythology, there are all these animals, um, but not so many. They did have du more ducks as pets, but I think that also might be an allusion to the god Amun, who, to whom the duck was sacred. But gazelles were also something that the Egyptians had occasionally as pets. My grandmother wow. had a pet gazelle. Really? Yeah, it was, um, it used to follow her around a bit like Mary's little lamb. But the only problem was you could never toilet train it. So when it was inside, it would just poo everywhere. And so oh, no. it had to be bad. <laughs> I, I think um, birds are the same, actually. Birds can't be toilet trained because they have no control. So keeping birds is a, is a, is a tricky thing to do. So I can understand why they might be caged or kept outside. Mm, and monkeys also, you have to put diapers on them. See, that makes cats all the more all the more likable to me. You don't have to put a, a diaper or a nappy on a cat. So we, we've talked a bit about exotic pets, um, like you mentioned about the start of the exotic pet trade being with monkeys. Did anyone have any really, really quite seriously exotic pets like lions or tigers or bears? Oh my, anything like that? Um, yeah, lions were definitely kept um, by the kings, by near Assyrian kings in the ancient Near East. Um, and they're pretty, I mean, not you, I guess you wouldn't really call them pets. They were sort of kept for, for game uh, and sport. And uh, so, yeah, if you go to the British Museum, you can see the lion hunt reliefs from the Palace of Ashurbanipal. And they are uh, incredibly detailed and incredibly like, visceral, big statement of power. The, the Assyrians were very bloodthirsty um, and we do get lion hunts in Egypt, but we also have kings who seem to have had lions and, as pets. And you see Tutankhamun with a little pet lion. And then you see um, Ramses II with a, several pet lions who accompanied him into battle to make him look even more fearsome. And there's this lovely relief in Abu Simbel which shows um, Ramses being victorious <clears throat> at the Battle of Kadesh, but there's a scene in the camp and the horses are all being stabled and given food and drink and then the lions are being fed as well. So it's a nice counterpoint. I really love the idea of battle lions. It's um, amazing to think that they could be sort of uh, trained to fight alongside things like horses and, and people in battle. Um, that's something that seems so crazy, but it, it, if the, the sort of pictures are to be believed those depictions then um then that clearly was possible back then if i was a soldier fighting next to the lion i'd probably be sweating a little bit uh <laughs> just in case just in case i looked tasty do you know how to defeat an elephant in battle give it a big mountain range a little mouse perhaps Good answers. Apparently, according to um, King Porus, who taught Alexander the Great, it's with pigs um, that apparently elephants are scared of pigs. And so they'll they'll be your your ideal animal to defeat the elephants. And there's quite a lot of this, actually, that if you're fighting with a particular animal, the way to beat them is like a different animal. Um, so they had I think it was like horses, the Greeks horses, when they were fighting people who had camels, the horses would be scared of how the camels smelt so that the camels could be like a line of defense because all the Greeks horses would just go mad and run around. Um, so, yeah, to, to defeat an animal, you've got to have a different smellier animal. Um, there was um, a, a Roman general called Pompey and uh, Roman generals and, and then later emperors would often put on uh, games for the Roman people, like free games, once they had uh, won quite a big military victory. And Pompey was one of the most successful generals of his time. Um, and he brought over a whole load of elephants uh, it, to, to actually be killed in the games. And um, there, there's an account uh, of some Roman viewers who who were so moved by these elephants and thought that they shouldn't actually be killed in the uh, in the amphitheater. This is not the Colosseum, by the way. The Colosseum wasn't built yet by this point. Um, so yeah, so they actually uh, <laughs> sort of protested against Pompey for bringing these elephants in to be killed. They were able to empathise with the elephants. 
So it's almost like a very early animal rights activist group. Yeah, although it didn't last very long, they still killed an obscene number of elephants in various Roman games. There's also a guy um, who made fake elephants to train his soldiers and horses um, because he was like, he was a Greek king um, and he knew that the Romans had some elephants, I think. And he was, so he made like all these uh, wooden elephants, which I think is so cool. And then he had like inside the elephants, there were pipers playing like harsh noises so that the horses and the cavalrymen could get used to this idea of an elephant. Speaking of horses, I have an against the law. Ooh. Because there's a there's like a, a myth that Caligula made his horse Incitatus a consul. You're joking. I was convinced. Well, it's it's close, like it's not too far, but this is in Suetonius, so I checked what Suetonius says. And okay, so Incitatus um wasn't his horse necessarily he was a horse that belonged to um, a chariot racing team called the greens so chariot racing was really really popular in ancient Rome and there were four teams the whites the reds the greens and the blues and the greens and the blues were like the two best teams they were like I don't know the arsenal and the spurs or whatever of of the ancient world Um, and Incitatus was a horse in the greens Um, and Caligula was so like obsessed with this horse uh, and, and with the greens as a team in general that he gifted an awful lot of, of money, both to um, chariot drivers that belonged to the Greens, but also to this horse. So he gave him a stall of marble, a manger made of ivory, purple blankets, a collar of precious stones, um, slaves and everything. And okay, so bearing in mind, Suetonius is very gossipy, and this is part of a paragraph that's a huge list of crazy, weird things that Caligula did. He ends this paragraph with, it is also said that he planned to make him consul. So this is gossip even in the ancient world. And it doesn't say that he actually made him consul. It says that he planned to make him consul. So this is like Donald Trump saying, I think so-and-so should do this thing. And then it never actually happens. That is a supreme against the law. That's what that's we're here so, for. Boom. That's so against the law. I don't <laughs> like it. Can you retract that statement? <laughs> No. I would say that's a good one. <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> you thought. <laughs> no. Defending history there. <laughs> uh, uh, no, fact is fact, I'm afraid. You can't be offended. Um, that was ri- That was probably the most against the law thing I think I've heard. Didn't they also kill all sorts of bears and tigers and all mm. sorts of things that they brought in for the game? So I think they must have massacred huge numbers of animals for games during the Roman period. Absolutely, almost to extinction. There's a a letter that Cicero uh, writes to his friend, if his friend is trying to put on some games uh, and he's writing to Cicero asking him to get some uh, some panthers for him from the from the province that Cicero is is sort of governing at that particular time and Cicero doesn't want to take those, he, he doesn't want to go to the trouble of um, finding these panthers but he also says that there are very few panthers to be found in in that area which is is starting to point to a certain amount of extinction gosh yeah that's, that's quite sad. an impressive amount of um panther killing i was going to say if we're talking about numbers of animals um Salima mentioned that um that trade in in animal mummies earlier weren't there a very large number of mummies found Salima? Yes, there were millions and millions of mummies that have been found. And we've got probably eight million dogs in one place and several million million ibis. And of course, cats galore. Um, Scarab beetles, not quite as many um, because they even mummified scarab beetles. I guess they just dried them up. Um, And shrews, adorable little shrews that are individually wrapped and sometimes they're put into these um, limestone cases with gilded images of shrews on top. So we have all kinds of animal mummies and some of them are exotic and some of them are local, but um, it certainly was big business. And these are all the ones that were given as offerings and not really as pets. That's amazing, why were shrews important? Shrews were associated with the sun god and um, it's because they have, they were thought to have keen eyesight and um, even at night. And for some reason, they just got syncretized with the sun god. And you have 
shrews as well as mongoose as a particular format for the sun god. It's quite funny because you get these teeny weeny shrews and we found some actually wrapped up with some falcons, but they are really adorable. They're sweet, aren't they? They're very tiny. Fierce and tiny. Absolutely. We can all aim to be that. So there are quite strong associations across the ancient world, aren't there, with animals and their sort of their um, qualities or counterparts in human emotions. So I, so I can remember there's an, there's an owl god uh, or a god relating to owls. Is that Athena? Yes. Um, so all of the gods have uh, a sort of sacred animal or multiple sacred animals normally. Um, Athena and the owl is a sort of they are really tied together in in sort of portraiture so when she's when she appears in um paintings or sculptures or whatever she almost always has her owl with her and Athena is the goddess of intelligence and wisdom so the owl is like it already got that uh reputation for being really really kind of clever and smart um but it seems to be a bit of like a the, the some really random sacred animals so like Dionysus who we love um the god the god of, of drunkenness and madness and parties and all that kind of thing um has like dolphins and serpents and tigers and donkeys apparently on that theme um there's a few sacred animals for for gods in the ancient near east and yeah as i mentioned gula earlier has her dog and adad the storm god has a bull kind of makes sense big thundering animal but my favorite is um is Marduk who was just like I don't, I don't want any old animal I want the mush hushu um and it's uh you might people might have seen it it's quite a famous image from the ancient Near East. it's on the Ishtar gate which has been reconstructed in, in Berlin in the Pergamon museum and this mush hushu dragon um is like scaly but has lion's paws and a serpent tongue and like eagle talon back legs um so yeah that was uh that was Marduk's pet. That's very cool. Um, because the whole sort of made up creatures, the mythological creatures are really fascinating. Has anyone read that book by, I can't remember her name, but she was suggesting that maybe some of the ancient, the people in the ancient world came across uh, skeletons of dinosaurs and other um, extinct creatures. And that's where some of the mythological um, animals come from. Yes, isn't that isn't that where they think that Cyclops as a as a mythological creature came from? Because an elephant skull has one large hole in the centre, which is where you'd think, oh, a, an eye socket would go there, and just it would just have one eye in the centre, and it must be a huge creature. That's yeah. so cool. I find it very interesting that um, dragons are in a lot of mythology around the world, and they seem to have sprung up on their own. So I think I think that gives credence to the fact that people through history have dug up bones of creatures and gone, this is clearly a huge lizard that mm. may or may not breathe fire and may or may not have wings. Yeah. Yeah, it's very cool. But there's so many places in the Fayum, in particular north of Bahareya Oasis, where there are all kinds of uh, fossils. So I'm sure that it did contribute to the idea of winged creatures and and, uh, you know, we've got so many winged snakes, for example. And then whenever we had, Barney, whenever we had uh, contact with the Near Easterners, we once again do more wacko mythological creatures. So you have it right at the start of Egyptian history, then in the Middle Kingdom again. Um, so it's fun to see how different cultures, when they connect, when they touch one another, what they choose to borrow. There's also um, a hillside in, it's now in modern day Turkey, which is called, I think now like the, so I would say Shemira, but I might've been saying it wrong. Shemira, Chimera, Chimera, all of those. Anyway, it's, it's called that kind of hillside and it actually, it spits out flames. It's, it's like a, uh, it's a very volcanically active area. So it's just um, like sulfurous gas that is naturally produced underneath the rock. And when it, when it reaches the surface, it oxidizes and creates these flames that literally come out of the ground. It's really scary. There's actually no sort of um, safety provisions for people not to fall into the flames, but it's fairly obvious where you shouldn't step. So like just don't step in the fire. <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's so cool. And apparently um, this was a big, uh, th this was scary in the ancient world because um, it's, uh, th these, these flames come out of the hillside quite close to some, uh, to some cliffs uh, and any ships coming in by that area might think that it was a lighthouse and would then get dashed uh, onto the rocks near these cliffs. So it was very dangerous and they might have 
characterize that, I think, as, as like a monster, uh, almost as a warning not to go near those rocks because then the, the ship that you're in would, um, would um, what's the word, founder. Smash. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> smash works. Um, I, I actually went to visit the site of the Chimera because it's uh, it was one of my favorite stories. I mean, the Chimera, the monster, and it, you do think that there's something lurking under that hillside, spitting out fire. But it was rather mm. sad when people started to roast their hot dogs over it. Oh no! Oh, that, that, <laughs> takes the, that takes the fear away a little bit, doesn't it? If you're having marshmallows and hot dogs over this terrifying natural phenomenon, <laughs> maybe that's why Marduk kept his mushushu around, you know, just to like light, light the occasional fire. Absolutely, really handy during barbecue season. In Mulan, the dragon's called Mushu. Is that yeah. related at all? Yeah, I was going to bring that up. It's remarkably similar, isn't it? <laughs> So we've talked about a whole range of animals. So my question is, was there such a thing as an ancient zoo? Oh, yes, I think there were several. Um, certainly in ancient Egypt, different kings would have had their menageries. And um, I'm sure that the Greeks did, because by the time we got to the Ptolemaic period, we have uh, menageries. And in fact, they were doing some excavations near Canopus and we found giraffe bones as well as all kinds of other animals there so I think that that was definitely the site of an ancient zoo. I don't know much about um, ancient zoos but I think Alexander the Great uh, had like collected animals while he was out and about um, conquering the world uh, and sent them back and that then there would have been a kind of royal collection of animals um, but I don't know yeah I don't know how similar that would have been to a modern zoo although I will just say the word zoo comes from ancient Greek so that's our et etymology hour for the day. Yeah, I think the idea of zoos haven't really changed, you know, if it's just a place where you show off loads of exotic animals. Um, again, the neo Assyrians are all over this episode, but they had um, a royal zoo, Asher Nazapal II, um, talks about his lions and monkeys and deer, ostriches, everything, elephants that he just displayed in his city, apparently, um, for everyone to see. And it just shows, you know, the reaches of the empire where he could bring these animals back from and, you know, people might be bringing them as tribute, for example. Um, so yeah, very similar idea to, to zoos, except obviously uh, now it's for charging 25 quid and, and then it was uh, showing off the empire. Buying a stuffed capybara toy on your way out. <laughs> yeah, Definitely. a weird school trip. <laughs> so as we do with every episode, we have a moment at the end of the episode to reflect on our favourite thing that we've learned during that episode. So I'm going to give everyone a moment to think about that. And Salima, I am going to pick on you, but it's a good thing, I promise, because normally someone steals your favourite thing. Then you have to think of something else. So Salima, what was your favourite thing that you learned from today's episode? Oh, it was about um, what Barney said about the, um, the dragon, the sacred dragon on the Ishtar Gate. I like that very much, fierce creature that it is. I do as well. I think that's quite a fearsome thing to have welcoming people, isn't it? Barney, how about you? What was your favourite thing to learn today? I very much like uh, Selena's great cackler goose, the, the, the big creation goose. I think that was cool as well, definitely. Xenia, how about you? I just couldn't get over Salima's police baboons. I think that's such an amazing idea. <laughs> that was definitely my favourite as well, so I'm going to have to think <laughs> fast <laughs> while oh, I'm sorry, thinking. <laughs> that's all right. Meg, while I'm thinking, what's your favourite thing? Um, definitely also the police baboon. <laughs> I can't get over that I think that's amazing I did also very much like also hearing about um animals being sort of mummified and stuff though I did also think that was very cool yeah I loved hearing about the little shrews and the sort of reverence that they were offered just like more fierce animals would have been um because they were f small and fierce in their own way I thought that was great thank you that was a really fun episode thank you all very very much Thank you for listening to another episode of Against the Law. If you can't get enough and are keen for extra content, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Against Law, and we're on TikTok too. And if you enjoyed this episode, please support us on Patreon. We have different support tiers depending on how much you can spare each month, and each one comes with a special reward to say thank you. We love to hear from you, so please reach out to us with questions or comments on Twitter or email againstthelawpodcast at gmail.com. Bye.